And a real pleasure to meet you. Likewise, Pat. Thanks for having me. I, before I talk about some of your more recent discoveries, I want to talk about geopolitics a little bit because Cote d'Ivoire, when you think, when I think of Africa, and it's just my upbringing, uh, I think of a dangerous place to invest. Is Cote d'Ivoire a favorable political environment? And I, and I mean more than just regulations. Yeah, definitely, Pat. I mean, uh, in terms of security, I probably feel safer there than going down to the States and being shot at. Uh, um, I've been there for the last 12 years, over 60 trips. Um, I've been uh, involved myself in, in grassroots exploration, uh, uh, involved in the forest, so bushwhacking away with a machete with our geos and whatnot, and uh, without any, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, locals with us and encountering sometimes farmers and, and so on. And uh uh, we've never really felt threatened at any uh, time uh, during those years. The other thing I might add is that uh, economically and politically speaking, Cote d'Ivoire is, is, is booming in terms of the economy, over 6% GDP uh, on average in the last several years. Uh, elections every five years, pretty much stable for the last uh, two presidential elections, the next one coming up in 25. Uh, so um, the the company, uh, not the company, but the country is moving in the right direction. If you had been there, let's say in 2013, when I was started going there, uh, and you fast forward to today, you would see a tremendous change, a, a favorable change uh, that happened in the country. So I think that the the current president over the years took the right decisions uh, with the investments made in terms of road infrastructure, uh, hospitals, education, and so on. Because obviously, you got to remember that 35, not, not, I mean, 75% of the population is 35 and under. Uh, and they're all looking for work and, uh, and jobs, but they are very, a very industrious uh, people, um, either being farmers or, or whatnot. Uh, so for me, Cote d'Ivoire is, is, um, is, is safe to be in compared to Mali or Burkina Faso, um, if you wish. And if I were offered assets in those two countries, which we have been uh, offered, uh, we've declined. We've declined because of the security issues. Okay, so let's talk about this gold project. I think you say Kasu uh, is the pronunciation, but there's three zones that struck my interest. Uh, the Jagger zone, the road cut zone, and the contact zone. Talk to me about those and your most recent drilling results. So uh, the road cut zone is the initial find that uh, we discovered way back in 2016. Uh, we were initially doing an alluvial play. We had dug 164 pits, uh, two meters deep, and out of the 164, only nine did not have gold. And Paul and I, Paul is our, our um, president and CEO, he's a geologist. We were driving on the road between Kusu and Bokobo. Those are the two towns on the outskirts of the permit. And uh, we fell upon the, the rock the face of the rock uh, that uh, is exposed because the uh, the road is built on, in the flank of the mountain. And that's where we made our initial discovery at Road Cut Zone. You, you actually saw gold in the rock right there? No, you did not see it, but the face was, was so uh, wide and open that uh, we stopped and uh, we uh, chipped away over 18 meters across. And um, the results came back at uh, 4.68 grams per ton over eight to 18 meters. And we chipped some of the veins that were there, the quartz veins, and uh, we had up to 15 grams per ton in there. So that, that totally changed our focus uh, of the project at the time, which was on basically an alluvial play. We noticed that we were in a hard rock, uh, Beremian formation, volcanic formation. So we petitioned the government to change the allocation of the area to semi and artisanal uh, uh, permits uh, to a large permit uh, application, which we were successful in doing after a number of months. And then the permit was allocated to us uh, three years later. So we got the, the permit late to November, I would say November 2019, COVID came around, then we started working in the summer of 2020. And so uh, we did a MAG survey and then a, a geochem program 
and so on. But it looks it looks like your focus has shifted though from that road cut to the Jagger project. Is that correct? That's correct. But we've also came back to to the road cut zone because um, um, initially when we did the MAG survey, we made some discoveries at Jagger as well, and then we we found a lot of mineralization. There were a lot of illegal activities, and we we sampled those where those guys were, and the results were fantastic. And then we started out our, our uh, RC program last uh, July, and mainly at Jagger, and we got fantastic results there. And uh, then we moved on to the road cut zone. Uh, so we did, uh, what, 50, almost 5,900 meters of uh, RC drilling um, through 53 holes, a lot of them in the Jagger zone. The results were fantastic, as well as the road cut zone. But then we continued trenching throughout the, the different areas that you just mentioned. And uh, along the road where I'm, I just mentioned that the, the wall um, is open, the rock wall is open to your right. eyes. Um, and that's for over a kilometer long. We channel sampled a lot of that area. And uh, uh, some of the trenching results we got there from there were like, 33 meters of almost five grams per ton, and then 40 some meters at that 4.6 grams per ton, give or take it up. Uh, but but you are, you're doing more than that. You're doing boreholes, aren't you? Yeah, we did boreholes, the RC holes. We did uh, 53 uh, RC holes uh, last year. And now we just finished a, a four point, uh, I'd say uh, 4,400 meters of diamond drill through 25 holes. Um, we came out with the results last week. Uh, we had published one result uh, or late uh, April, and then we went into silent mode because of the financing. Um, but uh, yeah, on the on the Jagger zone, our initial uh, discuss finding for the diamond drill hole was 38 meters at 1.55 grams per ton, which is not shabby at all. And then no, the results that we released last week. Uh, uh, on the uh, the road cut zone and Katie zone, which is another zone just above the Jagger zone. Um, you know, we've got 15 meters at one point gram, uh, one gram per ton, and then six meters at uh, 1.6. There was one at Katie. We got nine meters at almost 24 grams per ton, including one hot bonanza spot at 210 grams per ton. We do have some soil sampling that would have reached up to 100 grams per ton uh, on surface. Another borehole wow. we got was 11 meters at uh, 1.7, and then nine meters at 4.27 meters. So uh, grams per ton that is. So, I, I, I want to before we get on to the financing. I do want to touch on that a little bit. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to find gold; it's another thing to process it. Uh, how close or how easy is processing? Well, we're, we're extremely close to an existing mine. We're five miles away from the Yare mine site, uh, which is operated by per Perseus Mining. They, they came into operation, I believe, was in 2020 or 2021, the first quarter. Uh, they've been mining um, 250 to 275,000 ounces a year uh, since uh, operation. Uh, they have a mine life up until approximately 2035, but the, the peak production starts to uh, go down as of 2029. Uh, remember that they, they've invested nearly uh, $450 million before they poured their first ounce. So it makes no sense to us at this stage of the game uh, to uh, invest money in infrastructure and eventually a mine, uh, a plant, because it's next door. So yeah. our cash is allocated to uh, discovering as many ounces as we can on our site uh, with the hopes that one day the neighbor either takes us out or we do have an arrangement whereby they come in and, and, and um, uh, get our ore and treat it. And we have a, uh, an arrangement to, to that effect where we share the profits and, and expenses. So, okay, so the private placement is interesting. Uh, and you talk about the financing, that's the private placement. Obviously it demonstrates market confidence, I would have to say, uh, in able, being able to do that. But you also, as I understand it, brought in a new partner, Luso Global Mining. Tell me about that partnership. Yes, uh, we're quite happy to have these guys on board. Luso is a 100% owned division of uh, Mota and Jill. Mota and Jill is a Portuguese company, an EPC, engineering procurement uh, construction company, 
one of the top 20 on the European market, um, heavily present in Africa, had been there for over 70 years, uh, initially as uh, civil engineering projects, uh, but uh, since a, a, a number of years has have morphed into uh, becoming a mining contractor, if you wish. So they operate in nine mines uh, in eight countries in Africa. And uh, they bring a lot of, of experience in terms of operations uh, to the table to us. And uh, they, they took a position, they invested three and a half million out of the 7.4 that we raised. Uh, so they took a position of 9.9%. Uh, they are a strategic investor for us. Uh, and I would call them what, um, when I was, when I started this project many years ago with Paul Sargent, our president CEO, we would often discuss just the two of us uh, when being in country that it would be nice if we were be able to raise money with a white knight, a white knight being an anchor uh, financier, whereby um, as we progress, uh, our uh, financier is uh, accompanying us in the different raises that uh, we will uh, be doing over the years and we believe that that, that the, the Luso Global Mining uh, Company through uh, Mota Angel is exactly that for us. So it opens a total new uh, window of opportunity for Kobo. Um, the um, objective that we commonly have is to make Kobo a, a multiple holder of gold assets in West Africa and, and elsewhere on the African continent. So uh, we intend to put our efforts to play uh, going to forward on that. Absolutely. Ed, thank you so much for your time. All the best with Kobo. Thank you very much, Pat. Have a good day.